eight and two point two, where you yep. have to list all the um, sets. Do you have to put no the like a no set, like an empty set? I mean, yes. Or, like, okay. The empty set would be a subset, correct? Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Well. We're going to finish up 2.3 and maybe even get all the way through 2.4. And that's the goal for today. So if you want to take out your notes, um, we're going to pick up right where we left off. Um, Once the screen actually catches up to where I'm at. Here we go. Cool. So. We finished last class by looking at the cardinality of two sets, the cardinality of their union, and the cardinality of their intersection. And we formulated this conjecture, and you can see with the way things are shaded, that if we count everything in A by shading that in blue, that'll give us NA. Uh, Then we do the same sort of thing with B, but we shade it red, we get NB. And you can see that in the intersection, that's colored both red and blue. So while we're counting these things, we're counting the intersection twice. And so that is why we subtracted off this intersection over here, if you remember that from Monday's class. So what we'll do is just apply it over here. In this question, there's a survey of visitors at the Grand Canyon showed that 25 speak Spanish. 14 speak French and four speak both Spanish and French. All right, so why don't we let S be the set of people that speak Spanish? And what we're told by, or in this question is that 25 is the cardinality of that set. And then we'll let F be the set of people that speak French. And we're told that the cardinality of that set is 14. And then we're told one last piece of information that four speak both Spanish and French. So that's going to be the cardinality of S, F. And what is the operation between these two sets if you have an and? Intersection. Very good. Yep. So that's the keyword right here, right? Maybe underline that and draw an arrow to indicate that that's where we're getting this intersection from. So that is what leads us to this conclusion. And we're told that this is four. So, and goes with intersection or goes with union. So the question is asking us how many speak Spanish or French, right? So we're going to calculate the cardinality of the union of those two sets. And we have that formula from above, right? This is really the cardinality of the first set plus the cardinality of the second set minus the cardinality of the intersection. And we have numbers for all three of those symbols on the right hand side of the equals sign. This was 25 for the Spanish speakers, 14 for the French, and four for the people that spoke both of those languages. And so if you add those or add and subtract those three numbers, what do you get? Thirty-five. Good. All right. So either you can take twenty-five plus fourteen, add that together, and then subtract four. Where my mind went was I saw that we have fourteen minus four, which gives us ten. And adding ten to something is really easy. You just change the the tens place by adding one to it. So that's where we can get the 35 from. 
Uh, either way works. Those both are good. Cool. So that's how you apply this cardinality thing that we just talked about with the union. Mm -hmm. um, another set operation, which is fairly useful, is called the difference of two sets, A and B, which we have to be careful here. It's A minus B. I may also sometimes slip up and write it as this, as A forward slash B. Um, that's just a different notation for the same exact set. And to define that difference of two sets, it's essentially the set of all elements that belong to the set A, but not to set B. And so if we go ahead and shade in our Venn diagram, it's everything that's in A that is not in B. So you do not shade in the intersection. Is that okay? Yeah. Cool. So this is the set uh, A minus B, if you want to read it that way. And if we get into set builder notation, the difference between two sets A and B is indicated by this. So it's the collection of all X such that X is in A and X is not in B. And that's how you get that shading above. So let's play around with this. And just like other subtraction, right? Remember that four minus seven is different than seven minus four. So you have to be careful about the order in which you're subtracting. And you have to be careful about the order when you're taking these set differences. <laughs> so over here, for question one, we're essentially going to write out everything that's in A that is not in B. So we just look at all the elements of A, we check to see if it's in B. If it's in B, we don't write it down. If it's not in B, we write it down. So the first thing inside of set A is the letter B. Letter B is inside set B, we don't want it. It's not gonna be in the set difference. The letter D is the next one for A, that's in B, we don't want it. E is in A, but it's not in B. So this is the first element that we're gonna write down for A minus B. And then F is inside of A, F is not in B. So F is going to be in the difference. G is in A, G is not in B. And then H is in A, H is in B, so we do not include it. Is that okay? Take a second and try out question two. So the set difference A minus C. Do we have a question? Is that just the final answer, just E, F, G? Yes. Okay. Yep. yep. So maybe in words down here. So it's everything in A that is not in set B. Oh, I should turn those notifications off. Cool, try out question two, A minus C. All right, so figure out what is in set A that is not in set C. <clears throat> and once you have that, write it into the chat feature, but don't hit enter. Right, we're going to see how many people we can get to have the same answer. So take, I don't know, 30 seconds to write it down. That's probably not 30 seconds. I counted way too fast, but hit enter. Let's see what everybody says for question two. 
cool. Everybody's writing the same thing. Awesome. Very good team. All right, so this is the set. You essentially, uh, B is not good, E is not good, G is not good, so we have D, F, H. Ooh, that's a lowercase at H. Neat. All right, so what are we gonna have to do for question three? What do we have to find first and foremost? A prime. A prime, yep. So we come over here, we have A prime, we write that out, we have A, C, uh, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. I'm just kidding. Um, so that gives us A prime. Now we play the same exact game. So what is in A prime that is not in B? So A is out there, C is a good one. Um, I is in B, J and K are not, so there we go. And the fact that everybody got question two correct leads me to believe that you're understanding this perfectly fine. So just get that definition down. For part four, we just have to find C prime before we can calculate these set differences. All right, so that's A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. Don't know why I put so many letters. But there's the complement of C, and then you do A minus C. So B. Um, e. G. Weird. Hmm. Huh. Cool. Do we have any questions on that? I don't like that squiggle thing. This is actually set C. Huh. Maybe there's something going on in the background between taking the set difference of a complement and on top of that, up here, we end up getting that C is a subset of A. So if something's happening, maybe that's why our answer for part four is the set C. Um, do we have any questions on that? Can you just go over how like, like A prime and C prime, like how to get that? Yes, so essentially, you look at the set U and you write down everything that is not in the set A or in the set C. So for A prime, I looked first at A, which was not in big A. So I kept track of that. B is there, so I scrapped that. And then C is not in the set big A, so I keep it. And then I just keep playing that game of looking at the two different sets and keeping track of okay. what's inside. Yep. Yep. Cool. And if we wanted to draw a Venn diagram for this world that we're looking at, we don't actually have to list everything out. But here's the universal set. Notice that we have A over here. Does are A and B disjoint? Do you remember what disjoint means? That's a good question. That's what we're going to be talking about with these Venn diagrams here. Two sets with no elements in common. Good. So would you say that set A and set B are disjoint? Because we need to know the relationship for when we draw the circles. Correct, they're not disjoint because they both share B together, right? So there is something that they intersect over. And so when you draw your Venn diagram, you have this over here. There's B. And notice that 
if we look at C, C is a subset of A. Do we all agree with that statement there? Do we have any objections to it? Do we have any questions on why that's a valid statement that C is a subset of A? Got it, cool. And B and C share the letter little b. So they're not disjoint. How do we, in our Venn diagram, show that C is a subset of A? Put it inside the circle of A. Very good, yep. So if we put it inside the circle of A, we know it also intersects B. So down here is C. And, you know, if you have access to colored pencils or crayons or something like that, that helps to see what's going on. So we want to find everything that is inside of set A that is not in the complement of C. So I'm going to first start by just shading in the complement of C. So that's going to be all of this stuff. That is shaded in blue. And then I'm going to shade in all of set A. And now we're looking for, for question number four, everything that is shaded red that is not shaded blue. And the only region that is shaded solely red with no blue in it is the set C itself. And that's how we get that we have this thing happening over here. Right, because remember we say that two sets are equal if their elements are identical, if their elements are exactly the same. And B, E, G is each one of those elements is in C. Does that help to clarify how we can say our answer for part four is the set C? I highly suggest getting colored pencils and coloring these things in or shading them different shading ways, right? Like maybe one goes down and the other goes up and then you see where the, the cross hatch is for these Venn diagrams. And notice we didn't actually have to plug in any of the numbers. We just look at how they get shaded. Um, so that leads us to this next type of set operation, which you've seen a lot. You've probably never seen it in this terminology, but it's called the Cartesian product of sets A and B. Have we ever heard of a Cartesian thing before? Or maybe the Cartesian plane? Do we know who it's named after? I can't spell French, but Rene Descartes. And do we know what he's really famous for? He was a philosopher. Yes. And do we know what his his big three word or in Latin it's three words, but in English I think it's uh, I don't know. But do we know what he's really famous for saying? I think therefore I am. Very good. Yep. All right. So that's his argument for the existence of self. Um, cool. So he was an enlightenment philosopher. He's the guy that came up with the X, Y coordinate plane that you learned in regular 
geometry or uh, geometry and in algebra where you're plotting points holy cannoli what happened here we go all right so that's this x y that's the cartesian plane we're learning this thing called the cartesian product and the cartesian plane is an example of a cartesian product so symbolized it's just a times b and the way we read this is either a times b or i like to read it as a cross b that's a terrible way of writing cross and it's the set of all possible ordered pairs of the form a comma b where a is in the set a and b is in the set b using set builder not notation the cartesian product of set a and b is indicated by a cross b is equal to the set of all pairs a b where little a is in set a and little b is in set b Right, and so we're going to do some shorthand here. For orange, I'm gonna use the letter O. For banana, I'm gonna use B. And for apple, I'm gonna use A. Right, and so we wanna find the Cartesian product of A cross B. So this is the set of all pairs not the fruit pair, but combinations of first, you're going to take something in set A and match it up with something in B. And to keep it nice and organized, I'm going to first take orange comma one. Then I'm going to do orange comma two. And so that's all the different ways I could take orange and match it up with something in B. Then I move on to the next one, banana. All right, so I could do banana comma one, banana comma two. And then we can take apple comma one, apple comma two. Is that okay? So that's the Cartesian product, all those pairs of things. Right. If you think back to when you were in high school and you talked about pairs of numbers like X comma Y. Well, the first number is a real number. And I know you don't need to know the symbol, but that R with like the weird double line is the set of real numbers. And Y is also a real number. So essentially, when you looked at the XY plane, you were looking at the Cartesian product of R cross R, which sometimes, because it's R to the second power, you get R squared. So the plane is two dimensional. And then you can go kind of crazy from here and do like R to the third power or R to the 17th power or something along those lines and start talking about higher dimensional space which is kind of neat, but we'll go back to our example over here. All right, so what is the cardinality of the set A? Let's just keep track of that. Three, good. And what is the cardinality of set B? Two, good. And what is the cardinality of A cross B? Six, good. All right, we'll come back to that. We're going to create a statement that relates the cardinality of the cross product or the Cartesian product, 
with the cardinality of the two sets that form or that you use to form it. But let's look at question number two. This time, B is the first set. So we're always going to start with a number and then a fruit. All right, so I'm going to fix one and then just go through all the fruits. So it's one orange, one banana, one apple. And then we have two orange, two banana, two apple. And that gives us B cross A. And so what is the cardinality of B cross A? Six as well. Good. So is A cross B equal to B cross A? Yes. Let's be careful about definitions here, right? So we want to see if this is a true statement. When are two sets equal? Same elements. Good. So for A cross B, I have this element. I'll circle it over here. So I have this orange comma one. Does that pop up in this set B cross A? Is there an element orange comma one? Very good. Right. Remember that these are ordered pairs. If I said two comma three and I asked you to plot that, it's very different than three comma two. All right. So the order in which you list these coordinates dictates uh, where you land in the plane or all that stuff. So because these two don't have the same elements, they're not equal. But what are they? What's the word that we use when they have the same cardinality? They're equivalent. Very good, right? But they are equivalent. And so because they're equivalent, that means that there should be a one-to-one -one correspondence that tells you how to take something in the first set and turn it into something in the other set. And the easiest way to do that is just say switch where the coordinates are, right? So what I can do for a one-to-one -one correspondence that's super easy is I can take uh, orange comma one and just say, hey, that gets mapped to one comma orange. And I can do orange comma two gets mapped to two comma orange. And I can keep playing that game and that'll give us a one-to-one -one correspondence. If you remember those things, which you should all remember them things. Cool. All right, so that's me just pulling in more definitions that we need um, to make sense of all that stuff. Now, what about A cross A? We get orange, orange orange banana, orange A, then we have banana orange, banana banana, banana apple, I feel ridiculous saying this out loud, um, apple orange, apple banana, and double apple. And guess what I'm going to ask you now?
That's a very good guess. Yep, perfect. There we go. So what is the cardinality of A cross A? Nine. Good. Ooh, something weird happened. We didn't get six again. And then let's list out B cross B. This one shouldn't be that bad. Before we do that, before we list out B cross B, how many things do you think are going to be in B cross B? What is the cardinality of B cross B? What's your guess? Hmm. I'm seeing four pop up a lot. Why are we guessing four? How are you getting that? Is it because like A times A is the same as A to the second power? And like that's a the, good. the things like there are three elements in A and Three to the second power is nine, so there are two elements in B and two to the second power is four. That's a really good way to think about that. Yep. And if you want to think about it that way, if you look at our answers for one and two, A has three, B has two, and if you take two times three, you get six. All right. So with the cross product, you take the cardinality of the first one times the cardinality of the second one. And that tells you what the cardinality of the cross product is. Cool, I'm glad that people are picking up on that. Right. And we can actually list this thing out. Um, you get one, 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 two, two, one, two, two. <laughs> All right, and then we got B cross B, which gives us four. Neat. All right. And as was pointed out, when we look at the numbers and the cardinality and how these things are kind of playing against each other, the cardinality of the cross product is equal to the product of the two cardinalities. Six is equal to three times two. Six is also equal to two times three, which that gives us a nice little statement saying that when you take the cross product of two sets, doesn't matter which way you take the cross product, they're always going to be equivalent because they have the same cardinality because multiplication, when you look at NA times NB, it's gonna give you the same number. It doesn't matter which way you multiply them. Cool, do we have any questions on the set operations? So we have complements unions, intersections, set differences, and now we have cross products. So we have five brand new operations. Um, do we have any questions on any of those? This is how we take old worn out sets and turn them into brand new fun sets. You just, I don't know, take a cross product if you want. Or you take a union or intersection or something along those lines. These are our set operations. All right. So for this section, we're gonna be looking at how three sets can interact. And what we'll be doing for this chart is shading in different regions. If you are taking notes by hand, like you're copying down this stuff into your notebook, um, that's kind of tricky because there's a lot of circles that we're gonna go through relatively quick. Um, so maybe just pay attention and then come back to watch the recorded video to fill in the rest of the notes or I'll be posting the, the filled in notes to our um, Blackboard page sometime this week. All right, so you can always fill in the rest of these notes but if you're following along and you have this printed out, just shade in the regions that we shade. All 
So we want to find A intersect B intersect C. Where do you think that's going to happen? In the middle. In the middle, smack dab right in the middle. All right, so it is everything shared by A, B, and C. Good. And we know what A intersect B is supposed to be. We've been doing that for what feels like ages now. There's B, uh, A intersect B. We know what A intersect C looks like. It looks like our previous thing, just tilted on its side. All right, so we get it right here. And we know what B intersect C looks like. All right, so those are the intersections. How about unions? What is A union B going to look like? All right, hopefully I don't get in trouble for copyright infringement, but we're gonna be looking at Mickey Mouse ears. All right. Don't let Disney know I say that. I can't afford infringement costs. All right, cool. Then we have A union C, which essentially is, I don't know, tilted on side. Then we have ourselves B union C, which is down here. And then what do I do for A union B union C? Shading everything in? Except for what's shared. shared. Okay. Well, let's be careful here, right? Because remember, we're only looking at things inside of that rectangle. That's our universal set. So should I shade in the entire rectangle? Is it everything outside the circles? Well, we've got to be careful here, right? Because it's everything that's inside of A or inside of B or inside of C. So I'm just trying to get people to be very direct with the language that they're using. I know what you mean by shade it all in. It's going to be everything inside the circles, correct? Yep. So I'm just being very, for lack of a better term, pedantic about it. Um, I'm just making sure that you're using using correct terminology or being as specific as possible when it comes to describing these things, um, just to kind of train you into describing them in very um, succinct manner. Cool. All right, and then what about this last one? What is that saying? Would it be shade in everything inside the rectangle but outside the circles? Very good, exactly, yep. So we just shade everything that we did not shade in the previous one. Cool, so that is A union B union C complement. Now to verify that we have set statements are equal for any sets selected, we're going to use deductive reasoning, right? And remember, deductive reasoning is the one where we follow set rules to come to a conclusion, right? Inductive was the one where we looked at patterns. Deductive was the one where there's like the rules to the game and we just follow those rules until we come to our conclusion. So if both statements represent the same regions in the Venn diagram, then the statements are true for all sets A and B. Now this first one's gonna be kind of weird, right? We want to look at the complement of the complement of A and see if that's the same thing as the set A. Weird. 
right? So for this first one, I'm going to draw Here's the set U. Here's the set A. And if I want to shade in the complement of A, it's going to be everything in the rectangle that's not in the circle. So this blue region is a complement. And now, what would I shade in to give me the complement of a complement? Would you shade inside the circle? We would shade inside the circle. Good. But that's the same exact thing as set A. Right, so we end up getting that, yeah, yep. The complement of the complement is the set itself. So in a certain sense, complements almost act like negating. Like if you do a double negative, nothing changed. Um, if you want to think about this in terms of words, the A complement complement is the set of all elements that are not in the set of all elements that are not in A. All right, it's a double negative. You're looking at things that are not in the things that are not in A, which means that it has to be in A. All right, that's kind of the wording here. So let's try out this next example over here where we have A intersect B, and then we take its complement, and we want to compare it to A prime, or the complement of A, the union, the complement of B and just see what happens. So this first Venn diagram, this will be A intersect B complement. Here's the set A, here's the set B. Oops, get it together. There we go, A, B. And so what do I shade here? If I want the complement of A intersect B. Do we want to shade the middles of the circles or do we let's think about how we take complements, right? So if I start by shading in a intersect B, right? That is the yellow part right here. Can we see the yellow? That's really faint. Let's switch it out to not yellow. What color do we want? Purple. Purple, cool. All right, purple is my favorite color. Agreed. Right. Bam, cool. All right, so we got purple. That is the stuff that we don't want. So we shade everything else outside of there. Ooh, black is not gonna work. Um, I like purple and green together. That's a nice color combo. So the green is the stuff that we want. So notice that we get some of the things that are in A, we get some of the stuff that is in B, but we also get some stuff that's not in A and also not in B. Reminds me of the Joker or the Riddler, I think. Right, Riddler. All right. So that green stuff, we want to see if when we take the complement of A union, the complement of B, if we get the green stuff back. All right. 
So again, I'm going to draw A. I'm going to draw B. All right, what color should the complement of A be? Blue. Blue? What shade of blue? Do we want royal blue or do we want like baby blue? Let's go for navy. Navy? All right. We'll say that this is navy. All right. So here is the complement of A. All right. Then what color do we want to be the complement of B? Orange. Orange. Ooh, all right. That's a good one. All right. So we come over here and we shade in everything that's not in B. And then what do we do with the union? Do we take the spot where they're both shaded or do we just take anything that is shaded? Oh, I screwed up. Sorry. Oh, no. Come back. There we go. There we go. I got to find out where that orange was. No, that's the orange. Oh, geez. What happened? You get to see me fumble with technology. There we go. So do we take the stuff that has both blue and orange? Or do we take everything that is shaded for when we're doing the union? Everything shaded. Yep. Because remember, the union is taking everything together. So if we look at all the stuff that is shaded over here, and we compare it to everything in the first Venn diagram that we drew, the green, do those match up? Are they the same shading? Yes. Yeah. Should I do it in black and white so we can see better? Is this okay? So, yes. These two are equal. Right? So we get A intersect B. The complement of that is the same thing as A, the complement of A, union, the complement of B. So if you want to think of the complement as like negating your set, then it also negates the symbol as well, right? Because you can think of the opposite of the intersection as the union in a certain sense. Right? Those are going to flip. So when you take complements, it flips the sign around on you. Right. And so these two laws are called De Morgan's laws for sets, right? So we actually just proved the first one. If you take the complement of an intersection, it's then the union of the complements. What do you think the second of De Morgan's laws are going to say? What should I write down first?
All right, so you can think of the complement, the prime, as distributing across the operation, just like you would for like plus or minus, it distributes. But then you also switch the symbol. Yes. Very good. Yep. So that's the other of Dave Morgan's laws. Very good. Cool. Then you get like other weird properties. Um, do we have any questions on any of this stuff? So what I'm going to do is just pull up a blank paper. And let's see, right? Let's say that you have two sets, A and B. And I want to look at A without B. And I want to look at A intersect B complement. draw the two Venn diagrams out. So if you have, you know, if you printed out the note packet um, single sided, then just flip it to the previous page and work on the back side of that. Um, if you have re uh, space in the margin, maybe draw it somewhere in the margins. Um, I don't know if you have scrap paper laying around, but just draw the two Venn diagrams for these two different sets and see what happens. And once you have an answer, if they are equal, write the word yes, but don't send it in. And if they're not equal, like the shade of regions are different, write the word no, but don't send it in. And we'll work on this for, I don't know, how does a minute sound? Does that sound all right? And then after a minute, we'll hit enter and we'll see what everybody has to say about these two sets to see if they're equal to each other or not. And I'm going to put on timer for one minute. Ooh, what's going to be the sound? crystals sound like. Nope, we're not going to go with that one. That works. Cool. All right, so you got about 30 seconds left. Let's see what we got. Are these two sets equal? Yes or no? Do we need more time? I guess. I think we should take more time, maybe. Cool. Awesome. Very good. 
right, so these Venn diagrams help us determine when sets are equal to each other fairly fast, right? You all worked on it for 30 seconds or a minute or something like that. Um, and that was really quick. Okay, so definitely refer to sets, uh, Venn diagrams when you need like a quick reassurance on things. So if we did A without B, again, that was just the shaded here. And if we did A intersect B complement, well, here is B complement. That's all of this junk right here. And it intersects with A. So again, we just take everything that's got the double cross marks through it. That's the same exact thing as green. And so we would say that these two sets are equal. Right, so set difference is essentially the same thing as taking the intersection with the complement. Cool, all right, that makes me really happy that so many people got that. Uh, what about A without B and B without A? Are those two equal? What's your gut feeling telling you? Good, right? Because the first set on the left, this is stuff in A, not in B. And this stuff is stuff in B, not in A. And so these two would not be equal to each other. And better yet, can we come to any conclusion about how these things interact? Would there be anything shared by these two sets? A, here's B, lost my colors, here's A without B, here is B without A, and so what can we say about A without B? intersect B without A. What is that equal to? That's a very festive Venn diagram with the red and the green. Did not intend for that. Is it just the intersection of A and B? Well, let's look at our picture, right? Is there anything that is shaded both green and red? It's the empty set, very good, right? There's nothing that these two things share. And we can see it with the Venn diagram, right? You got the green stuff over to the left, you got the red stuff over to the right, and there's nothing in the middle. Cool, all right. So I think we can leave it there. That sounds pretty fair. Um, so we just finished 2.3, which means you have the ability to take care of all of the homework that is due on Tuesday of next week. Um, take your time, try out the practice problems. Again, the only way you're going to be getting really good at this material is if you practice a lot of them. And I can't assign a whole bunch for homework because then it just bogs you down too much. So a lot of the practice problems would make for excellent homework questions. I just don't want to bombard you with a bunch of homework because I know that your other classes are giving you homework 
and you're taking most of your classes online and that's just not fun to have a bunch of homework. So the practice problems are there for you to improve your skills. And I highly recommend going through and working on some of the practice problems. But if you don't have any questions, enjoy your weekend. We're good to go for the rest of this week. Um, if you have questions about this material, feel free to swing or to, to hang back and we can talk more about these sets and Venn diagrams and intersections and things. Um, otherwise, I also have office hours tomorrow. So enjoy your weekend. Get outside and build a snowman or something if you have snow. I don't know. Have fun. Have a good evening. I will see you all on Monday. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Have a good, have a good weekend. Yeah.